Yeah. Okay, well, um, good morning, good. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope y'all are doing well. Uh, this is our fast track uh, Bible survey, uh, Zoom Bible study, Tuesday and Thursday. Thank y'all for joining in and uh, uh, in an attempt to be part of what God is doing in the world. Uh, before we get started, we always like to spend a few moments of silent prayer to give everyone the opportunity to make sure that you are in fellowship with God. Uh, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him controlled by the spirit. And so in preparation for our study, let's spend a few moments to examine ourselves. If there's any way we, you have offended God, let's take this moment to utilize 1 John 1, 9, which tell us if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us and clean us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for another day of your grace. Uh, thank you for your unfailing love. Even though we fail, your love for us never fails. And Father, we ask of you to clean us from all sin that we know about and even the sin that we don't know about so that we can be able to be controlled by your spirit and be able to be mentored and taught uh, and in life by your spirit. Uh, and not because of our confession, we ask for forgiveness, but because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Bless our time together in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we are doing a study of the doctrine of God. This is a Bible survey, and the first doctrine that we're looking at uh, is the doctrine of God. This is our fifth class, and we're looking at the uh, person and character of God. We're looking at the attributes of God. And uh, last week, we looked at the justice of God, and we saw that uh, what that means is that God is fair. He always deals equally with all men by holding them accountable to himself and to his standard of holiness. He can never be unfair. And so God justice guards all the other attributes of his character. And he would never compromise his uh, character. Uh, um, in other words, he evaluates man through his justice. So the righteousness of God rejects sin, whereas the justice of God have to judge sin. And God don't show partiality uh, with no one because he holds men to the same standard of righteousness. And so what the righteousness of God accepts, God justly rewards without partiality. And from that same righteousness, God rejects um, uh, unrighteousness. And as a result, he uh, judges. And so uh, he is fair when he judges us, and he also fair when he rewards us, because whatever his righteousness accepts, he rewards. And so that was the justice of God. And we saw that we all were born spiritually dead, and the justice of God judged us with the penalty of sin. And today we're going to be looking at the righteousness of God and also the love of God. We may not finish uh, the love of God, but we will uh, uh, finish the righteousness of God. And these three divine attributes, the justice of God, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God and the love of God is God's integrity. And they are, these three attributes work together. For example, uh, uh, God's righteousness demands righteousness. And whatever his righteousness accept or reject, the justice of God execute. But in love, God provide a way for men to escape his justice and therefore receive his righteousness. And so these three divine attributes, justice, righteousness, and love, form God's integrity or his, his, his character. But he cannot uh, uh, compromise his justice and his righteousness just because he is a God of love. His justice must be satisfied 
in order for him in love to display his grace. And so that is what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ satisfied the justice of God because we were unrighteous and justice demand that sin be judged. But in love, God provided a way to escape uh, the penalty of our sin through trusting and believing in the work of Jesus Christ. And so we'll start with the righteousness of God. So if you go to Psalm. Uh, chapter 11, verse 17, Psalm, chapter 11, verse 17. And Psalm 11, um, um, verse 17. Can I get, uh, well, I'm done. Verse 17, I'm sorry, verse 7. For the Lord is righteous, his, he loves righteousness, the upright will of behold his face. The Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness. And see, righteousness here, which is an, an attribute of God's character, simply means that God is holy. He is holy, he is perfect in all his ways. He is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, set apart from sin. He's set apart from sin. And in order to fellowship with God, one must possess God righteousness. And the moment we as believers believe, uh, God gives us this righteousness and, and this righteousness gives us a right standing with God and by having a right standing with God, we escape the justice of God or we escape the penalty of our sin, uh, which is death. So righteousness simply means that God is always right. He always acts in perfect accord with his holy character. And here in verse seven, the psalmist say that he loves righteousness. And when I read this, if I have God's righteousness given to me the moment I believe in Jesus Christ, as 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we may be made, uh, may receive the righteousness of God in him. And so the moment a person believes, God gives him his very own righteousness. So God personally love the believer because the believer have God's very own righteousness. See, God loved his righteousness and whatever his righteousness is found, he personally loved that personally, person. Now, God loved all of us unconditionally when we were unrighteous. No matter how good we were in ourselves, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, but God see us as holy or perfect when we receive the righteousness of Jesus, uh, and therefore he loves us personally. So he loved the unbeliever unconditionally, who don't possess his righteousness, but he loved the believer personally because the believer possessed the righteousness of God as a gift. So righteousness uh, that we receive the moment we believe in Jesus is our right standing with God. So I have a right standing with God, not because of my own righteousness, because I fall short of perfect righteousness, but I stand right with God because God has given me his very own righteousness because God is inherently righteous or right, always right, always perfect. And he gives me that perfection the moment I believe in Jesus. So therefore, I stand right with God. Now, the book of Romans shows us how we can be made right with God. The theme of Romans is how to be right with God. The righteousness of God is the theme of the entire book of Romans. And, and if you go to uh, Romans chapter 1, Romans 
chapter one, we see that in the gospel, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, God showed men how they can be made right with him. Because God is righteous, and the only way to be made right with God, we must possess God's righteousness. We cannot make ourselves as righteous as God. God has to give us righteousness as a gift in order for us to be made right with a right God or a perfect God. In Romans 1, Romans 1, if you look at verse, um, verse, um, 16 uh, and 17, Romans 1, verse 16 and 17. Verse 16 say, uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So here, Paul say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel message because the gospel message has the power to save the lost person, whether they are Jews or Greek. And then in verse 7, he say, for in it, in what? In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. In other words, in the gospel, God reveals how men can be right with him, how sinners can be made right with God. See, the Jews thought that they can be made right with God by keeping the Mosaic law. But no matter how much they try to be good, they can never be made right with God through human works, through works and performing. And so God himself had to give men what they cannot obtain in order for men to be made right with God. Go to Romans chapter 4, verse 21. Romans chapter 4, verse 21. Romans uh, chapter 4, verse 21 and 22. Verse 21 says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophet, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. So God imputes his very own righteousness to the person who believe in Jesus Christ. So righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone, not through keeping the law, not through human works or performance. Righteousness comes to us through faith alone in Christ alone, according to Romans. See, apart from God, apart from faith in Jesus, Man have, has no righteousness. Apart from Jesus, man have no righteousness. Look back. Three. Look back at chapter three, verse 10 through 12. Men think that they can do to be made right with God. No matter what men do to be made right with God, no matter how good they try to be, they can never be right with God apart from God himself providing his very own righteousness. And Romans 3, verse 10 uh, through 12 say, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is no, none who does good. There is not even one. So God is saying, there is not one person who is perfect. There is not one person who does righteousness. So apart from God, all we have is a old sinful nature. And our sin nature corrupts everything about us. Even the good things that we do have been corrupted by our sin nature. Therefore, God sees us all guilty of sin, no matter how good we appear to be. Because none of our goodness can mount up to the perfect standard of God's integrity or God's character. And so, but God gives his righteousness to us to give. So that is what righteousness means. Now, once we receive the righteousness of God as a gift, the perfection of God, 
as a gift the moment we believe, then we are to live right through the power of the spirit and through the power of the word, we are able to be sanctified or live right in our lifestyle. See, I am already righteous in Christ, not in myself. But now that I am saved and have God's righteousness given to me as a gift, God through his spirit and word is displaying that righteousness in my practice, which is a process. That righteousness is practical righteousness, also called sanctification. And sanctification simply means to be made holy in practice, to be set apart from sin unto God for his use and for his holy purposes. So I got a question. On what basis do most people judge righteousness? On what basis do most people judge righteousness? And anyone can answer that question. On what basis do most people judge righteousness? Anybody? On what basis do most people judge righteousness? Maybe on what they do. Okay. But also, when compared to other people, conduct and character, people convince themselves that they are righteous. I'm not like so-and-so. I don't commit the sins that they commit. I am not as bad as others. In other words, they compare themselves with other people and therefore they convince themselves that they're righteous. So they judge righteous, righteousness based on the conduct of others instead of judging righteousness based on the conduct and character and the integrity and the holiness of God. If I measure myself by that standard, I find myself to be just as sinful as everybody else. Do y'all get what I'm saying? Do you get the point there? Yep. If you remember the, uh, I don't know where that passage is on top of my head right now, but when the, uh, the Jesus had, had shared a parable about the the uh, the the the, the publican and the the sinner. Uh, the you, you remember anybody remember uh, that uh, parable he shared about the publican, uh, the Pharisee and the and the publican. Uh, how the uh, the Pharisee was praying, he was thanking God that he wasn't like everybody else. <laughs> He said, he said, Lord, I would, let me find if you If you guys remember that passage, if it come to your mind, let me know. Because I would like to visit that because that brings home that point I'm trying to, trying to make on uh, how people judge righteousness on how they appear uh, as, if, as they compare. It's Luke 18. All right, Luke 18. Can y'all go to Luke? Um, 18, please. Luke 18, uh, verse 9. Look at, look at 9, verse 14. Luke 18, 9 through 14. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and view others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. 
I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified or declared righteous rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. So what we see here is people, the Pharisee trusted in his work, and as he compared himself with the tax collector, he appeared to be righteous. But when compared with God's character, Jesus say he is unrighteous. But the man who saw himself how God saw him as a sinner was able to receive the grace of God and the free gift of justification by faith or declare righteous. So those who don't see their need of righteousness because they have exalted their own righteousness will not be righteous or receive God right. It's not standing right with God, but those who see themselves as unrighteous, unrighteous and look to God for forgiveness in faith, receive righteousness as a gift, gift so they can stand before God justified. And so this is how men, most people judge themselves as it relates to righteousness. All right, go to Psalm, uh, speaking of uh, righteousness, go to, uh, go to Psalm 119, 142. Psalm 119, 142. Psalm 119, 142. 142 say, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is the truth. And then if we go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, 2, 1 say, my little children. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, this verse is so important because God don't forgive us because of our own righteousness. He forgive us because of the righteousness of Jesus. Jesus satisfied the righteousness of the father he was right in every sense of the word and so when we fail even in our christian life as believers and become unrighteous through our sin and we come to god confessing our sin god don't forgive us because of our confession we are to confess but he forgive us because when we confess Jesus Christ at the right hand of God the Father intercedes for us, and he say, Father, I have died for that sin. Me who is perfect, I was perfect, died for the imperfect. And on the basis of Christ's work, the Father forgives us of post-salvation sin and restores us to communion and fellowship with God when we confess our sins. So I am forgiven already eternally, but in my everyday life, I need to confess my sin for fellowship and experience God's power in my life through my confession. And God forgives because our advocate who was righteous and who also satisfied God's justice at the cross 
intercede on our behalf. So we're saved from discipline because of the righteousness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, so that's the righteousness of God. God is always right and always act in perfect accord with his holy character. And we receive a right standing with God the moment God gives us as a gift his very own righteousness. We should never compare ourselves with others and determine whether we're right with God, but we're to measure ourselves by God's righteousness. And then we all have no reason then to boast in what we do, but boast in the finished work of Christ and the righteousness that have been given to us as a gift. All right, so the next attribute we'll look at now is God is love, the love of God, the love of God. Well, if you go to uh, 1 John, we in 1 John, look at chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 8 through 11. 1 John, chapter 4, verse 8 through 11. Verse 8, well, let's start at verse 7. 1 John, chapter Four, verse 7, 7 through 11. Excuse me. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also are obligated or ought to love one another. Now this word here, agapao, love, God is love, agapao, well agape, uh, agapao from agape and agape simply means uh, uh, it means uh, seeking the highest good for others without any uh, uh, conditions added to the gift so God's love is unconditional, is God's unconditional kindness toward those who don't deserve it. It is always seeking what is best or the highest good for others. And God's love is unconditional. It is unfailing. It is undeserving. It is unending because it's eternal and God is eternal. And that is God's love. And, and verse uh, 8 say, for God is love. Now, is speaks of the essence of a person. In other words, love is part of God's character. He don't fall in love. He don't fall in love. God, God don't fall in love. See, if you have to, when you fall in love, that's human love because human love is motivated by the goodness of the object or what the object of your love can do for you. It is motivated by the action of the object. So in other words, if I am in a relationship and I tell uh, when I was in a relationship before I got saved and I told a woman that I love her, I wasn't talking about the love that God has, I was talking about conditional love. I was talking about, I love you because there's something about you worth loving. So it's conditional. It's conditional. And I'm not thinking of the highest good of the individual. I'm thinking about what that person does for me or how that person makes me feel. And if that person character is, is not up to my standard, then I no longer show that person kindness. That is not, that's how human love operates. It's conditional. 
It is failing. It is weak. Human love is weak. Only God's love is strong because God's love is unconditional. He always seeks the highest good. And how did he demonstrate that he saw our good unconditionally? And it says here in verse uh, 9 that he revealed or demonstrated, showed us his love, unconditional love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God had sent his only begotten son into the world. So God's love motivated him to provide what man needed by providing a savior. And guess what? That was unconditional because there was nothing about men that was worth God giving them anything. But yet God gave his son because that is part of his character. Love is part of his character. It's part of who he is. And you know, none of us are said to, are said to be loved. You know how weird it would sound if, if somebody say, Keithian is love. In other words, the very essence of Keithian's character is that of love. In other words, all he does is love. That is, he can't do nothing else but love unconditionally. That would be a lie. That would be a lie because I'm not God. Love is not part of my love is not part of my character apart from God. The love that I have apart from God is conditional love. It is love motivated by what the person can do for me. But God is love. It's part of his character. Love is not part of my character. Only way love can be part of my character if I am a believer and I've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, then I have the love of God shared aboard in my heart by the Holy Spirit. So without the spirit, I don't have true biblical love. All love that I have without the spirit of God or without being saved is a selfish type of love. That's why I, I laugh, not laugh, literally I don't laugh, when a, when a woman think a man, or not just a woman, but even a, a guy think that somebody that, uh, uh, Somebody that um, have a relationship with Jesus Christ, when that person say they love you, they're not talking about unconditional love. If they're without Christ and don't know Christ, they're not talking about unconditional love. They're talking about human love. And you find out that it's human love when you get old, that person want to abandon you for another relationship or when you lose that attractive that you had when um uh, when you guys were dating when you lose that attractiveness as you get older uh and that person start desiring somebody else and want to uh, uh uh cast you to the curb uh or if you lose the wealth and the the money uh, and, and 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 they're looking for somebody else uh, then that is human love. That's how humans operate without God, without Christ, and they love conditionally. But God love is unconditionally. He always seeking what is best for us, and he, no matter how much we fail, his love for us never fail. We don't deserve his love, but he give it to us anyway. And and this love calls for us to reciprocate, reciprocate. So God. Uh, love, so he voluntarily commits to give of himself, and because he give of himself for our benefit and our good unconditionally, then we should volunteer, voluntarily commit ourselves to his plan because he first loved us. We didn't love God, but God loved us. Go to Romans 5, verse 6 to 8. Romans 5, Six to eight. And see, love is an action word or action verb. Roman five, six, six to eight reads.
Verse 6 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. See, that's love. Christ, thinking of what is best and good for ungodly people, gave his life for them. That's love. That's unconditional love. When you're giving out of yourself or sacrificing yourself for the needs of others, even though they don't deserve it, even though they're obnoxious, even though they, they don't meet your standards, you're still giving for their benefit. That's true love. And that is the love of God. Verse 7 says, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. <clears throat> and no one took Jesus' life. He voluntarily committed to give him, commit, committed to give himself for the good of mankind, even though we did not deserve it. Go to Psalm 136. Psalm 136. Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. So here we see that God's unfit loving kindness here is the Hebrew uh, word uh, hesed. And hesed, H-E-S-E-D, carries the idea of unfailing love. His loving kindness is everlasting, meaning God's love is unending. Human love is not unending. Soon as you don't meet people's standard, they no longer love you. That's human love. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who alone does great wonders, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the great light, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The sun to rule by day, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The moon and star to rule by night, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who smart the Egyptian and their firstborn, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And brought Israel out from their midst, for his loving kindness is everlasting. If you remember, Israel did not deserve God's unfailing love, but God loved them because of his own character, not because of their character. God is faithful to his promise to Abraham. So in spite of the unfaithfulness of Israel, God still demonstrated his unconditional, unfailing love, undeserved, unending love to the people of Israel when he brought them out of the Egyptian captivity. That is what love is all about. If you go to Hosea, then we'll close with the book of Hosea. If you go to Hosea, the book of Hosea is like, if you want to see the, uh, uh, the greatest picture of the love of God, read the book of Hosea. If you want to see the greatest picture of the love of God, look at Hosea relationship with his wife, Gomer. Let's go there, and then we'll wrap up our evening. Go to the book of Hosea. I love this book. Hosea. Because God is going to use Hosea experience with his wife to teach an object lesson to Israel about his love for them. In verse one, do we have any volunteer readers? 
I got a little signing issue here. Any volunteer readers? Yeah, where do you want me to start? All right, start at verse one. Let's go to uh, one through uh, nine. Let's go to one through nine. Chapter one, right? Yeah, chapter one, verse one through nine. Okay. Lord, the Lord gave these messages to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Joash, was king of Israel. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute, so some of her children will be born to you from other men. This will illustrate the way my people have been untrue to me, openly committing adultery against the Lord by worshiping other gods. So Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Deblaim, and she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. And the Lord said, name the child Jez Jezreel, for I am about to punish King Je Jehu's dynasty to avenge the murders he committed at Jezreel. <laughs> In fact, I will put an end to Israel's independence by breaking its military power in Jezreel Valley. Soon, Gomer became pregnant again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to Hosea, name your daughter Lo Ruhama, not loved. For I will no longer show love to the people of Israel or forgive them. But I, the Lord their God, will show love to the people of Judah. I will personally free them from their enemies without any help from weapons or armies. After Go Gomer had weaned Lu Ruhama, she again became pregnant and gave birth to a second son. And the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, Ami not my people. For Israel is not my people, and I am not their God. Okay. So, so what we see here is that God tells Hosea to marry Gomer. He already know what actions this woman is going to make in her marriage. She was going to be unfaithful. She was going to have children on her husband. She's going to be unfaithful. And so God going to use his experience as an object lesson. So each child name means some form of judgment from God. So God is going to judge Israel just like Hosea's wife is going to go through punishment because of her unfaithfulness. But after judgment come restoration would demonstrate that God's love never fail, even though man may fail because God have to keep his promise. He have to honor his word so even though men may be faithful, God's love for them never fail. Now, that don't mean when we worship and serve idols and sin that we won't get discipline. But before discipline, God demonstrated his love through his patience. See, he had been patient for a long time, and that's his love. In spite of their failures, he was patient. But now in verse 6, God patient ran out. But even when God patient runs out, to discipline them through uh, using uh, 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 heathen powers to take them into captivity, he's still going to promise later that he's going to keep his covenant with them. He's going to still do uh, fulfill the promise he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David. But then you go to uh, chapter 2, verse uh, 1 through uh, 7, we see what happens to an unfaithful woman. Uh, and, and can you continue, Brian, at chapter 2, verse 1 through 7? What happens when this woman was unfaithful and had uh, uh, babies outside of her, her marriage? What happened? Let's, let's keep reading. Okay. But now, call Israel to account, for she is no longer my wife, and I am no longer her husband. Tell her to take off her garish makeup and suggestive clothing and to stop playing the prostitute. If she doesn't, I will strip her as naked as she was on the day she was born. I will leave her to die of thirst. 
as in a desert or a dry and barren wilderness. And I will not love her children as I would my own because they are not my children. They were conceived in adultery for their mother is a shameless prostitute and became pregnant in a shameful way. She said, I'll run after other lovers and sell myself to them for food and drink, for clothing of wool and linen and for olive oil. But I will fence her in with thorn bushes. I will block the road to make her lose her way. Uh, hold on right there, Brian. Go ahead. Okay. When I read, when I, every time I read this, I think about discipline. Because that's what's happening here is God is reasoning with this woman who is being unfaithful and he's telling her, stop, stop. Don't continue to run after the, the, the other men. But what God is saying to Israel is, why are you going to continue to commit the sin of adultery through idolatry, putting someone else or something in the place of God in your life? You're going to be disciplined if you don't, uh, I'm trying to barricade you in and prevent you from continuing in that sin, but you're continuing going back to that sin and I'm going to discipline you. And so she's not going to uh, uh, hear the warning. And see, there are three types of discipline. God will warn us first. And if we don't heed warn, he intensifies the discipline. But it don't mean that he don't love us. But he demonstrated his love through his patience. But sometimes we are stubborn and we continue to want to go our own way. We still want to find satisfaction and happen in everything but God and people and things. And God is saying, I'm trying to uh, uh, um, spare you, but you're going to pursue all these other things as though it is the source of your happiness. But then God give her freedom to go and look what happened. Keep going. Verse seven say she will pursue her lovers, but she would not overtake them. What do you think that mean? When he say that Gomer will pursue her lovers, but she would not overtake them. She would seek them, but not find them. What do you think this mean? What do you guys think this mean? Because remember. God tried to barricade her, or her husband tried to barricade her in to keep her from being unfaithful. But she didn't want to listen. And she kept pursuing her lover, and she would not overtake them. What does it mean she would not overtake them? Um, I think it means that she would never be satisfied. She will be forever looking. Okay, good. Exactly. In other words, the picture here, think about your life as an unbeliever. I think about my life as an unbeliever. How I saw fulfillment and happiness in everything and everybody but God and never found it. I still was empty. Still was empty. And even in my, even when I became a believer, that been times in my life where I lose perspective and start thinking that something else can give me satisfaction than God himself and doing his will and then when I get that thing or that person or whatever, I'm still empty. <laughs> in other words, you're going to be in bitter remorse when you don't listen to God and you try to substitute him and his will for sin. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband, for it was better for me than now. You should have learned that long time ago. Did it take all these years for you to realize that there is no happiness and fulfillment and meaning and purpose in life apart from God and doing his will? But now she has bitter remorse and she want to go back to her husband. It sounds like these people who they abandoned their marriages because the grass seemed like is 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 is, is more beautiful on the other side in the world, the grass looked green. And then once they abandon their marriage, get out of the will of God and, 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 and have some infidelity relationships, then they realize that the grass ain't green on the other side. I'm going to go back to my husband and it may be too late. 
This is how Gomer was. But guess what this man did, though? Look what, <laughs> look what was, go ahead. Somebody want to say something? Any questions or comments? Any questions or comment? No, go ahead. All right. So what's going to happen is this woman is going to get used and abused by her lovers. And once her lovers have used and abused her, they're going to dismiss her and sell her into the slave market. Okay. And then God is going to speak to Hosea. And look what he say. Go to chapter. This is after she got disciplined. Look at chapter three. Look at chapter three. And starting at verse one, can somebody read verse one through five? And, and we'll stop here. Chapter three, one through five. Then the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband. So even though Gomer was being unfaithful, and would not stay home, but was running around with all these different men, this man's love for her never failed. He never stopped loving her. Yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loved the sons of Israel. So God say, even though Israel had been faith, unfaithful, searching for happiness and meaning and purpose in life apart from me, but through uh, uh, by turning to other gods, idolatry, I still love her. I still love Israel. In verse two, so I bought her for a, myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. So here we see that Hosea's wife was in the slave market being sold as a slave. Now the average man who operate on human love would probably leave her in the slave market after she don't have that many children on her. But this man purchased the freedom of this woman and took her back as his wife. That is grace. That is unfailing love. That is God's love in action. Then I said to her, you shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So I will also be toward you. For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pill, and without Ephraim or household idols. Afterward, the Lord, I mean, after the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last day. So you see, God is saying, I'm going to discipline Israel with the Babylonian captivity. Well, northern Israel is going to be totally wiped out. But through Judah, I'm going to bring them back to the land. I'm going to fulfill my covenant with David. And there is going to be a king who's going to sit on the throne and rule over Israel forever. That is prophecy about Jesus Christ coming to be Israel king. And they rejected him in his first advent. But during his second advent, when he come back again, Israel is going to receive her king. So even though, even today, they're unfaithful, but God is faithful. He's still going to fulfill his promise. So that is the unfailing love of God. And now God is calling us to operate on this same type of love toward one another. First, we got to love God for him loving us. And then he wants us to show this same love toward each other. No matter how much we fail each other, we're still to seek each other highest good. We always show kindness to those who don't deserve it. This is the only way a marriage could last for many, many years. You got to show unconditional love because you got two individuals who are selfish by nature, two individuals who have many flaws and many failures. And throughout their relationship, the only way to last and have a strong marriage is functioning on the love of God. All right, we'll stop here. Any, any questions or comments about the love of God? Any questions or comments about the love of God? 
I'm really thankful for it. <laughs> Me too. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we'll stop here. Brian, if you don't mind, if you could close us out with a word of prayer, that would be awesome. Absolutely. Heavenly Father, wow, we just sit here in awe of you, Lord. And your, your word speaks to us in so many different ways. It's alive and well, sharper than any two-edged sword and reaches us right straight to the marrow. And, it, and your word did that for me today. And I love it. I've, I've read these passages before because I can see all the highlighter marks in my Bible, but yet it still speaks to me in a whole different way every time. And we love that about your word and how true it is and how right it is and how perfect it is and how it fits in so many different ways. And Lord, uh, we, we, we just bless this word today and we, we bless uh, pastor for, for bringing it. But we also ask that uh, you would bless the word that it, we, we might apply it better and greater than we did yesterday. So we just give you this all. I bless everybody that's here right now, Lord, um, and blessing the rest of their week. Love on them, just like you showed us your, with your unfailing love today. And may we show others that same unfailing love. And we ask all these things in the powerful and precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you guys for joining in. God bless you and love you. Take care. You too, brother. Thank you. Good night. You're welcome. Good night.